Right, uh, here we are again um, with our monthly session of physio and, and talk and Q&A with Mary. And thanks again for joining us, um, joining us this Sunday. Um, what are we talking about today? We're talking splints, orthotics and bracing. Awesome. OK, well, I will leave it over to you. OK, good evening from a very, very wet London. It's pretty cold and horrible as well. Tonight we're talking splints, orthotics and bracing, and I have a little extra surprise should we have time at the end, and that's this wonderful stuff that everybody seems to love, and that's tape. Um, I can't promise we'll get round to that, but if we don't, we will definitely talk about it at some time because everybody loves to be taped. So let's start with the terms because one of the confusing things are all the different names. Well, are they splints? Are they braces? Are they orthotics? Generally, in medical terms, we call the whole lot orthotics. It doesn't matter whether it's a collar or something to go inside your shoe. They are orthotics. Now, the people who make these are called orthotists. And the orthotists decided a few years ago that they were going to standardize the names of all these different things. And the names of these things are all based around where they work. So if we start from the top, a CO is a cervical orthosis or a collar. A TLSO is a thoracolumbar sacral orthosis, which is a spinal jacket. So all these crazy names just indicate which part of the body it's working on. So an FO is nothing rude. It's a foot orthotic. It's basically something that goes inside your shoe. So an insole or a heel cup. Now, let's get real. Different places, different orthotists, different doctors, different ideas. We will never get consensus on the right orthotics. All I can tell you tonight is what we recommend at Great Ormond Street, why we recommend it. And that's important so that if you're having a battle, you can decide whether that battle is worth fighting locally that does not mean we are right. It's just the way we do things. Now, the other thing that you cannot do without orthotics is you cannot do it without somebody who understands SMA. And this is one of our biggest problems. We are very lucky at Great Ormond Street and Evelina and possibly one or two other of the neuromuscular centers have the services of a company called John Florence Limited. Now, John Florence, unfortunately, is no longer with us, but the company are probably the most experienced company in the UK in SMA. There are other companies with perfectly good orthotics, including Peacocks in Newcastle. We don't always do the same thing. The important thing is we have the same reasons or we want the same outcomes. Let's start at the beginning. A bad orthosis, a bad splint is worse than no splint at all. That's the first thing. The second thing is an orthosis, a splint, a brace should never, ever cause pain. Now, I have heard children complain of pain and I have heard people say to them, you will get used to it or put up with it or it can't hurt because it looks OK. Not acceptable. A splint must be comfortable because if the child has to wear it, the same thing, if you're going to wear shoes that are too tight or uncomfortable, you are going to complain. Nobody can tell that child it doesn't hurt. It may be that it doesn't. Maybe they just don't like wearing it. But if it becomes a battle with the parent, then you need to speak to your physio or orthotist and see how you can get around that. Some splints are essential. Some can be worked around and some cases you can jiggle the times the way you don't have to sleep in it if you can't sleep so the first thing is a bad orthosis should not be used if it's causing pain it should not be used what else makes a bad orthosis the wrong orthosis an orthosis that has outlived its usefulness or needs changing for something different 
a badly fitting orthosis or the wrong idea. And we'll go through some of those as we go through. Now, there are many ways you can get orthotics. You can find things online. You can go to rogue companies or you can go to good companies. Ultimately, the questions you must ask the person supplying the brace, do you understand SMA? That is just the single most important thing. That person must understand SMA. So once we have got through that, there are two ways you can get a brace. You can get it custom made, which is rare in adults. Custom made basically means it is made for you and only for you. So that there is a cast taken of that part of the body, including the trunk. Cast is made and the splint is made from that cast. Now, there are other ways of doing this apart from Plaster of Paris. There is now 3D printing. It's extremely expensive. Very few of the mainstream companies are using it. And ultimately, the orthotics made for these children will be as good from a good orthotist as they will be from 3D printing. It is coming, but at the moment it is far too expensive to expect your NHS orthotic companies to be using 3D printing. So if your private company is telling you, wow, we're using it, you will get equally good without using it. So custom made is made for you or your child. The other one is off the shelf. Off the shelf is one size fits all and it doesn't always. We know that but in the vast majority of adults, you should be small, medium or large, and that is your choice. You may be extra large in some cases, but you need to fit into that bracket and that doesn't always work. So that is a big problem. If you don't fit into that nice, small, medium, large, extra large, or you're a little bit tall, a little bit short, a little bit skew if you may not manage off the shelf. And that becomes a problem of cost and budgets. No budget is endless and not every company will actually be able to make exactly what you want custom made. If it's a jacket, it may be very difficult to provide an adult or a much, much larger child. How a jacket is cast is very, very variable. There are people who cast them in sitting, people who cast them in lying and then roll the children onto their front, which a lot of them don't like. There are all sorts of ways of casting. Again, John Florence Limiters have developed a method that is fine for the children, seems to work and produce jackets that fit. But they are not the only company that can do that. Now, the other way of making particularly foot braces is by sticking your foot in this box of funny green stuff that looks like an oasis that you stick your flowers into. It's that sort of um, printable green stuff. You put, push your foot down and you get a footprint. I am not a big fan of those. My honest belief is the child cannot weight bear properly, so cannot reproduce a weight bearing posture in that. If they're not weight bearing, it's an easier issue, but then if they're not weight bearing, why are they wearing that sort of orthosis? Andy, are we going to take any questions there or should we crack on? No, let's go on for a little bit longer. We are getting some questions coming in, but um, I think you may answer some of them as you go along. So uh, let's okay. keep going. No problem. Just so, well, just so the people are aware. Right. What I want to do, I've got Ike with me if we need Ike. If you haven't been with us last time, this is Ike uh, because he's from Ikea. So what we're going to do is start at the top and work down to the bottom. We will not be saying a lot about arm splints. We will be saying something about hands, um, but it's rare to make actually functional arm splints. But we'll talk about that. OK, so we're going to start at the top, not including the head, not including the helmets. Some parents may have seen these what they call plagiocephaly helmets much, much, much too heavy for a child with SMA, therefore skew iffy heads. There is a lot of controversy about whether they work at straightening the head. 
but they are definitely not something we would ever recommend for a child with SMA. So if your child has a slightly skew if you head, then what you need to do is get the child into a good position to use their head as much as possible. So we don't use plagiocephaly helmets. Okay, so then we go down to collars. Do we like collars? Previously, we would have said no, we were always concerned that the child's head would weaken if they were in a collar the whole time. But we have always suggested collars for traveling in car seats if the child left, lost their head. And this is especially true when it is one parent in the car with the child. You cannot, now that there are no front car seats for little ones, you cannot keep turning around to retrieve their head. So we always suggested collars for children in car seats if they needed them. And the other time we used to suggest them was in school if the children were really fatiguing and couldn't hold their head up. But we certainly don't advocate collars the whole time. With the increasing numbers of children with type 1 SMA, we are using more and more collars to help these children sit. And the one we prefer is this one. This is called a headmaster. And by showing you it on the iPad, unfortunately it looks enormous, but this is an infant size. This piece goes under the chin. This piece rests on the breastbone here, and there's a strap that goes around the back. It's quite comfortable. It can be adjusted. It can be made bigger or smaller. This is removable and washable. The strap is removable and washable. It's very comfortable. A lot of the children like them, but it has no support around the back. So for a child who falls backwards, if there is no support behind the head, this will not work. The beauty of this is there's no restriction around the neck, so it can be used with a tracheostomy. If you have a child with a tracheostomy, that's breathing through a tube here. So they are very, very easy to use with a tracheostomy. They do not restrict speech or swallowing, and they are generally, the kids like them, they're comfortable. But as I say, they have no support around the back. There is one called a Miami J that will go all the way around, not quite so easy to use with a tracheostomy. They have to be chopped up and a bit more restrictive. They need trimming around the ears. This is generally the headmaster is the one we prefer, but it's certainly not the only collar available. We do not recommend they use the whole time because like with everything, we do feel that the neck muscles need to do some work. But when the head is at its floppiest and if you're getting tightness at one side, it's certainly worth considering using it for periods. So that is a CO, a collar, a cervical orthosis. Moving down, one of the biggest complaints, one of the biggest bugbears, one of the biggest issues for parents and children is this thing. A spinal brace. This is a John Florence spinal brace. This is the normal John Florence spinal brace. It opens, but side to side, it's quite rigid. The most important part of this brace is this waist contour here. That sits on top of the pelvis and the control works up from here. It also helps to level the pelvis and get the child sitting symmetrically. Now, the next most important thing about any spinal brace in SMA is this, the tummy hole. Children, adolescents, adults with SMA are tummy breathers. They need to be able to expand here. Also, if you have a peg, gastrostomy feeding, you need to be able to accommodate the peg. Sometimes if the child has the jacket before the peg, the hole may need changing. If they have the peg before the jacket, then the orthotist should make the hole around the peg. We use, or should I say John Florence, use a one-piece brace. 
they never use two pieces in these children because it is not felt to correct. That does not mean that some other orthotic companies will not use two pieces. They do not correct quite as well unless this opening is just the center section and the sides are all in one piece. This is a front opening jacket. Again, this is the usual way of bracing these children. The different straps are irrelevant. The buckles, the fastenings are not the most important as such. What's most important is that they are in the right place and they do up adequately. They can be Velcro, they can be these little things. Some of them slide in and slide out, but a jacket has to fit over the waist. It has to have a tummy hole. After that, it must not be too low and sit on the thighs causing pressure. And it must not be too high up under the arm because it's, there's a lot of nerves and vessels in there. And if the child is resting with the jacket tucked up under the arm, you can actually get numbness and loss of movement and feeling in that arm. So that is really important. Now, many children slide down into their jackets. I hate to say this, if they do, if it fit well when it was first put on by the orthotist or physiotherapist and the child slides into it, then you are not doing it up properly, low enough or tight enough. A jacket must be fastened in lying. It can be put on in sitting, it can be taken off in sitting, but it should be fastened in lying. It doesn't, if it's made properly and made well, restrict breathing, but some of the children do not like it fastened to eat. And if that is the case, then that includes gastrostomy feeding. If that is the case, you can open the straps while they're eating or having a feed. But then you have to consider when you tighten it up, they should be in the lying position again. Now in school, that's not always convenient unless their wheelchair tilts in space. Or they can have got a facility to come out of their chair. Some people will say, well, that's fine because they wear the brace in the morning and then they have lunch and then they take it off. Why are we wearing braces? Why are we wearing any splint? We're wearing braces for three main reasons. Firstly, to assist sitting. In that situation when a child cannot sit without the brace, it really doesn't matter whether it goes on in the morning, comes off at lunch and is off for the afternoon. If the child is using the brace to correct deformity or to control deformity, in other words, they're very floppy and don't manage without it, although they can still sit, or they're developing a scoliosis which we wish to try and control or possibly even correct, and some of them are correctable, then it is important to think, when are you wearing that jacket? There is no point in having a jacket that goes on in the morning when the child is at their most active, moving around, restricted by the jacket, have lunch, take it off when they're tired or fatigued, and then they're slopping over to one side, they're tired, or take it off when they come home from school and slop in the corner of the settee for the next four hours in the most horrible posture. We need to think when that jacket is most effective. Now we talk about 23 hours a day. We do not in our unit use bracing 23 hours a day. Other orthopedic surgeons say 23 hours a day, the hour off is for exercise or bathing or whatever. We believe the problem of the spine is trying to maintain the spine against gravity when the trunk is weak, long, 
heavy, difficult, without good head control, so that we're trying to keep the spine up against gravity. When you are lying down, we do not think that the jacket is needed. That does not mean all of those of you who have been told to wear the jacket in bed at night, whose children sleep well in the jacket at night, to stop doing it. We just do not advocate sleeping in jackets. That's our system. It doesn't work for every orthopedic surgeon. It doesn't work for every neuromuscular doctor. You have to go with what you have been told. But think about why, if your child is really unhappy about it, if they have foot splints, knee splints, BiPAP and everything else, if you feel that they're almost a plastic person going to bed and it's all getting a little bit too much, you may want to think, which bit can I remove? And it may be the jacket. But it is so important to get that jacket right during the day. The other time that we would recommend a jacket is on is long periods in a car seat because if the children fall asleep or get tired, again, they will lean one way and usually always the same way and sitting up in a buggy because again, they get tired, they fall asleep, they're leaning one way. So ideally, if they're spending periods in a buggy or a car seat, they should have their jacket on. Where is the evidence for jackets? There is no real evidence for jackets. And the reason there is no real evidence for jackets is because it is very hard in the medical world when you believe something works to take something away. So to do what we call a randomized controlled trial would be extremely difficult because we would have to pick five, 10, however many children, match them, say, right, you're wearing a jacket, you're not. But to get those two children almost identical and say the same age, the same scoliosis, the same sitting, the same activity, the same movement, and then compare what happens over six months or a year is very difficult if you are withdrawing a jacket from one child and their scoliosis deteriorates quicker than the child who is wearing the jacket. Many orthopedic surgeons will say they're a waste of time. We do not agree. It is experience, it is consensus, it is generally believed in the neuromuscular world, this is not just about Great Ormond Street, that a spinal jacket, a good spinal jacket, will slow down the progression of scoliosis. It won't stop it. It won't stop it happening. It won't stop it deteriorating, but it will stop it deteriorating at the same rate. Now it can hold a fixed scoliosis and it can correct a mobile scoliosis. It won't do it forever. And in some children who are getting the growing rods, there is varying advice from the orthopedic surgeon as to whether the child still must or must does not need to wear a spinal jacket as well. Some orthopedic surgeons say with the magic growing rods that the child should still wear the jacket because the rods are flexible and they want to protect the rods as well as the spine. Some surgeons feel that the rods are enough and do not need the jacket. You have to go by your individual orthopedic surgeon. I cannot say one way or another what you must do in that case. You must go by what your surgeon has told you. Andy, where are we? Do we need some questions answered? Yeah, we've definitely got some questions coming in now. So let's I thought we might. <laughs> right. Um, first question. Do you need referrals to go private for braces or splints? uh okay now that depends on what we're talking about do you need a referral we have had a little contretemps as a couple of parents know with a bracing company who are private i am going to show you a picture of the brace because i had a bit of an argument with the man it's called a scoli brace this is the scoli brace it is advertised on the internet. 
It is for something called idiopathic scoliosis. There is nothing to say it will work in Esther May. And this is one of the people in their advert. Not really the sort of children we would expect to see in a spinal brace. Now, idiopathic scoliosis is a scoliosis that occurs in children and teenagers for no known cause but ultimately the muscles are normal in these kids and it is only the spine and the bones of the spine that twist. They're running around, they're ambulant. This is not SMA. We do not go for scoli brace or idiopathic scoliosis braces. So if you're going privately to one of these, firstly, nobody's going to give you a referral for them because they are not authorized to supply braces on the NHS. So we cannot get a referral for you. If you are unhappy with your orthotic company locally and they seriously cannot supply a brace, you can ask your GP to refer you to another orthotic company. If they're going to pay for a brace from your local hospital, which is going to do nothing and fit, they may as well pay for a brace from a company who does know what they're doing, but not Every GP will agree to that because some have fixed contracts with certain companies or certain hospitals. So yes, some GPs will refer you privately for a brace because they're paying exactly the same as they would be going to your local NHS hospital. You don't need a referral to go privately. Most of the good orthotic companies will see children privately on parental referral but they would want to speak to your local physio or local orthotist to see what the problem is and why they are not managing the child locally okay excellent um another question my son has recently been given been given a two-piece spinal brace is this suitable for sma the question you have to ask first and foremost is, is it comfortable? And the next and more important question is, is it doing the job it was meant to do? Now, what was it meant to do? Because I don't know your son. Was it just supposed to support him in sitting because he can't sit? Was it supposed to be correcting his curve or merely holding it? Now, irrespective of the fact it's two piece, is it doing the job it was made for? Is it producing any result? Is it correcting his spine? Is it holding his spine? Is it comfortable? Is it functional? Is it leaving marks? Does it look right? And is he happy wearing it? So two pieces may be working. Generally, most orthotic companies do not use two pieces in SMA, but if it's working, that's fine. If it's not working, then you have to ask, why they've got a two piece rather than the more usual one piece. But don't forget that your physiotherapist should be able to help you decide whether your orthosis is suitable. This is not just about what we do at the neuromuscular centers. Your local physiotherapist should have knowledge of orthotics if they're a pediatric trained physio, even an adult physio working in neuromuscular will have experience of orthotics. If you have a very young, inexperienced therapist, ask to see their senior because any pediatric physio should have experience of bracing. If they don't, then ask to see a more senior person. But it's very difficult for parents to argue with orthotists. I know that. And it's really not a pleasant thing to have to do. You need an opinion if you believe your child is not being braced correctly. Great, thank you. Uh, another question. With regards to collar, my son travels in a wheelchair, but his head flops on the bumps. No one has ever advised on the collar. Whom should I seek advice from? Well, the, obviously the most important person would be a physiotherapist. One would hope that there is a physiotherapist in your area who will have some experience of using collars, even if they don't have a lot of experience of collars in SMA. 
But, it, you know, it's really quite distressing if your head's going to keep falling backwards, forwards or sideways, and you've then got to stop and retrieve it. If it's just for the traveling around, and presumably if we're talking about bumps, we're talking about outside, and then the collar can come off when you're inside. But it should ideally be a physiotherapist, or it might be an orthotist. Some orthotists are experienced in collars. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. Are Lycra braces okay? No. Okay, let's talk Lycra then. Lycra suits. Lycra suits from different companies. Spot the problem with Lycra. Firstly, no tummy hole. Secondly, toileting. Not all of them. Some of them do have zips and bits and poppers and whatever for toileting, but it obviously is going to affect the way it fits. And although you see all these lovely straps going sideways, which are supposed to control posture, they're supposed to control forces. The nice brightly colored one here just has the forces going straight up and down, which is not going to do very much. These, as you can see, are trying to use a three-point pressure, but it's only two-point. This one has three-point pressure, one, two, three. This one has three-point pressure. But generally, everybody but a very smallest child is not going to be held by Lycra. Now, that does not mean I am totally against Lycra. I do not believe it works as well as a jacket. There are two other things that come in Lycra a lycra vest, which can have sleeves or no sleeves, and lycra pants. And there are certain situations where you have very floppy shoulders or you have quite kyphotic shoulders where you can bring the shoulders back. That's not gonna work for a child with a very kyphotic spine, but just the shoulders, it could bring the shoulders back, not the whole spine. And the pants for some of the very wibbly wobbly type threes who have a lot of movement at their hips when they're trying to walk, then the Lycra shorts could be useful. But the Lycra suits, apart from the fact they're a beast to get on and off, have disadvantages. Now, I do not know of any parent where they have had Lycra where they can honestly say it has held their child straight. But in some of the milder children, some of the type threes and some of the milder type twos, it may be that a suit is enough to control their posture during the day with these new drugs. But somebody should be monitoring it closely. This is the really important issue. The problem that we have is that people tend to give out these suits and nobody is monitoring. X-rays before you go into it. Six months maximum before you have another X-ray. Is that spine changing? Is it being held? Are your joints getting tighter? Is it having a positive or negative influence? The milder type twos and type threes do not have as many respiratory problems so the tummy hole does not become a major issue. But the type ones and the weaker type twos, and when I say a stronger type two, I mean a child who can crawl. Anything below a child who can crawl should not be wearing Lycra. It's not going to hold them. Okay, excellent. You mentioned x-rays. We've, we've got a question that's come in. Um, about x-rays and that is uh, should you have a spinal x-ray in the spinal brace to see if the curve is corrected when wearing it? That's only if the plan is for the jacket to correct the spine. We know that in some cases when the spine is very rotated or quite stiff then the brace is more about trying to hold it than correct it. If we're really looking for correction, then we can x-ray in and out of the brace. The biggest problem we have is x-rays are invasive. We want to prevent over x-raying these children. People talk about x-rays as though they've suddenly become safe. 
What you have to remember is the child who has chest infection after chest infection, there's a lot of hospital admissions who will have repeated chest x-rays. We do not want to keep x-raying that spine. So unless it is really necessary or the child generally does not frequently have x-rays, but you need to remember an x-ray is still invasive and we want to minimize the number of x-rays. We rarely x-ray in and out of the jacket because we are able to look at that jacket and say, yes, that is corrective. And a good jacket, you should be able to see right from the bum, right from the way the weight bearing through the cheeks, we talked about that previously, in posture, that you should be weight bearing generally equally through your two bum cheeks. And you can see if one is sticking out further, if, if the jacket and the child are still leaning to one side, if the child's just disappeared inside and not being held or disappearing, or the jacket is so low that it's not holding, not holding, it, it can't hold a kyphosis, the curved spine that curves forward. It's very, very hard for a jacket to hold that. That is why a lycra vest, if it's more shoulders than spine, may work. But again, we have to accept lycra jackets, they're all passive. The child still needs to exercise that spine, that tummy, all those muscles at some point. Okay, great. Um, we've got more questions coming in or do you want to continue with your presentation, Marion? Uh, let's go on a little bit. We can go down to hips. There is very little for the hips. Um, as I say, there are the lycra shorts for some of the milder children. Uh, we have to ask whether sleep systems work for hip flexion contractures. We cannot manage hip flexion contractures. We've talked about this, but there are very few orthoses for the hips that are tolerable and acceptable. Now we know that children with dislocated hips can be managed in certain braces. But these are children with normal muscle power. These are not SMA children. I have to tell you, we are having a national hips workshop this summer. We are getting hip experts both in and out of neuromuscular to come and talk about SMA hips because we feel that it is becoming a bigger and bigger problem with new treatments. But as it is at the moment, there is no brace for hips. So then we move down to legs. And I have two types of braces for knees. I have my absolute favorite because it is cheap and easy. And these are gaiters. And all are better type ones and all are weaker type twos. And I make no excuse for saying every good type one, every type two with head control should stand at some point outside a standing frame in gaiters and then in cathos if they're managing the gaiters. No excuse. I don't care what any physiotherapist says. They can send me bombs, grenades, whatever they like. The best position for these kids is standing. And nobody is going to convince me otherwise after 30 years of doing this. These are gaiters. It takes me a little while to get them apart because there's a multitude of Velcro straps. They are not custom made, but they are made to fit. Let me move back a bit so you get a better picture. This is basically a piece of canvas with three metal bars. Now, there are padded ones. You can have big, fat, chunky ones. You can get them with six bars, far too many. Three is more than enough. And then a series of Velcro straps. When you're putting them on, they need to go as low as possible down towards the ankle, but not over the bones, unless the child is wearing an ankle splint and then the splint can go, the gaiter can go way down and they should go up without cutting up bits that shouldn't be impinged on at the hips, but they need to be as long as possible up to the bum. 
no metal bar over the kneecap. So what you've got is you've got the kneecap in between the metal bars here. You wrap it round the knee and you tie it as tight as jolly possible to stop the knee bending. And then you stand the child up. Now if they've got very wibbly wobbly ankles. They may need a boot. Ideally, they would be standing with these. So you've got your little ankle splints, your plastic AFOs, which we will come on to, and your gaiters, and you stand, and you stand all the type twos and type good type ones who've got head control. Gaiters, they're about 80 pounds a pair. You can buy them on the internet, but they really don't come in enough sizes. But no physiotherapist should say she cannot get gaiters, not in the UK. They are available in other countries. I know we've talked about them in many, many places in Europe. They aren't available. Get a sewing machine out and find somebody who can chop you some metal bars. It's not difficult. Find somebody with a sewing machine. That's a good business for a lot of people in Europe. When you're doing well in gaiters, then you go to CAFOs. Now, apart from the type ones and the type twos who are in CAFOs, I will again move back a bit so you can see what this is. This is a long leg brace, knee, ankle, foot orthosis because it goes over the knee and the ankle and the foot. We also use these for all our pre-teenage type threes who lose ambulation. Nothing upsets me more than type threes who lose ambulation, who are left to rot without standing in something dynamic. Oh, put them in a standing frame is not enough. And in this day and age, it's definitely not enough. With the new treatments around, we need these threes as active as possible. Now, in the UK only, or should I say in England only. NICE have agreed that if you lost ambulation within a year to 14 months prior to the beginning of New Sinersen, you will get to New Sinersen, but the small print says you need to get walking again within a year of starting treatment. So these are essential to get these kids walking again, or gaiters, something to get these kids back on their feet and if you just stand them in a standing frame it's not going to work now these are john florence orthoses developed by the man himself i know that at least a few other physios around who knew the man stroppy and difficult but absolutely brilliant wonderful guy and this has not changed a lot since the first ones that john developed so let's start at the top the single most important part of this orthosis this is the thigh corset and that in effect this bit here is a little seat for the bone in your bum and this is called ischial weight bearing or gluteal weight bearing and they literally have a seat under the bum to help them get their pelvis back and get them upright and that is a really important part of the caliper unless they are a good type three and only need the control at the knees but otherwise they should have this a lot of orthotic companies make them without and that's why the children don't do so well it's really important that the child is correctly fitted with orthotics okay so this is the thigh corset from the back this is the thigh corset from the side. And look, for some reason, our calipers only have one bar. Why do they not have a medial bar? If you had muscular dystrophy, you would have two bars and a knee lock. In SMA, the children only have one bar. And this is a strange anomaly with SMA. We have a solid kneecap. It can be made to flap open. Generally, it's not, but it can for some children. It's solid. It does not 
push on the knee it supports the knee you can't really see inside but the kneecap sits in there and rests this holds below the knee joint it holds at the top of the tibia and the kneecap is resting in there why is there only one bar in sma those of you who know anything about sma will know apart from some of the stronger type threes for some reason we really don't understand these children have knock knees their knees go inwards and this is to control that tendency for the knee to bend inwards so if you're looking at the knee from the front it wants to do that and this is what this single solid kneecap is all about you can have leather you can have all sorts of things they will hold leather definitely stretches you can have a double bar and the knee will disappear off to the side but this is what john developed and again it holds really well it stops the children clunking together when they're trying to walk which so often happens in other calipers knee lock easy open not easy to lock with a knee flexion contraction we know you should never force the knee down you go slowly 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 and then lock it but very easy to unlock down down to the foot section now debate about the foot this is a foot splint actually it's easier to show you on this one I think this is a foot splint this has a full foot the foot comes right to the end of the toes and beyond that is a night resting splint or a daytime splint not for weight bearing there is some differences of opinion as to whether there is full foot or short foot we do short feet on our orthoses it's the way John Florence does them we like them it allows the child to lean forward onto their forefoot it gives some flexibility to the foot and it allows for weight bearing not every orthotic company will do that so that you have to accept that your orthotic company may have a longer foot the other thing that's nice is they tend to need a wider shoe but if it's not quite as long, it tends to be a bit easier to get the shoes to fit. Now, this is a normal ankle strap, just a straight ankle strap, but there are straps called Y straps. I haven't actually got an orthosis with a Y strap, but a Y strap comes from both sides, be it outside or inside, and it's to control the rolling foot. So a Y strap, will a straight strap is a foot just to hold it back in the splint, but a Y strap around the ankle is to control the foot that rolls. Someone's just died. Okay, so that is a CAFO. Yes, we are known at Great Ormond Street Physio team to be big, big fans of CAFOs. We like our kids in CAFOs. Not every physio does we cannot say we are right and they are wrong it's just what we do andy i think we've probably got a million and one questions now got quite a few um right where shall we start let's go with um this one my daughter's spinal jacket hole is uh hold on that my daughter's spinal jacket hole is of the whole front not just the belly it is the chest too is that right um i'm not quite sure what what this parent means by the whole front um so you talk, i guess earlier on you talked about having a hole in the belly for, for there is a rib. tummy hole if it's too big then it's not going to hold the ribs securely but if you feel that it's holding well and it works well for your daughter then that's fine as long as the rest of the brace is holding where it should be holding so if there's a gap in the chest um as long as well, it's, it's, holding a gap, well. it's not going to be holding as well but 
you know, I can't say that it isn't because I can't see their child, but if they feel that it's working and the child is comfortable in it, then maybe it, it could well be working. Okay, cool. Um, right, another question. Are there any soft orthotics that could or should be used at night if a child is walking regularly feeling uncomfortable? Specifically, he says he wants his legs straight and feet flexed. Can you talk about sleep systems also, please? Um, maybe sleep systems is a topic in its whole self. But... Sleep systems is coming up under um, equipment, which we were going to talk about separately. So I would like to keep sleep systems separate, if you don't mind. No, it's fine. What about the, um, the question about orthotics, uh, soft orthotics to wear on? Uh... Sorry, Andy, can I repeat the question? Yeah, so the first part of the question was, um, are there any soft orthotics that could or should be used at night if a child is walking regularly but feeling uncomfortable? Soft orthotics that could be used at night if the child is walking regularly but feels uncomfortable. I'm not sure why you would put orthotics on an ambulant child at night. So I... I can only assume you mean they're uncomfortable in bed at night. Then I would look at sleep systems and find out why they're uncomfortable at night and what it is that's causing the problem. Because this doesn't sound like an orthosis problem. This sounds like a sleep system or sleeping position issue, which is not really an orthotic problem. Awaking, not walking. Sorry. Awaking. Waking at night. Again, waking at night is positioning. And if their orthotics are waking them up at night, yes, you must do something about waking at night. For two reasons. I do not accept children waking at night with uncomfortable orthotics. For two reasons. One is the child's not getting any sleep and the other is the parent's not getting any sleep. We have to ask three questions. Why is the child waking? Is it actually the orthosis that's uncomfortable? So that can it be made comfortable? Is it because the orthosis is stopping them from turning over in bed? And sometimes two foot splints or two knee splints will stop the child rolling. So then try alternating one one night, one the next night. Or if the child is waking because the splints are giving them cramp or uh, making them feel uncomfortable, but not real pain from the splints, then we would look at trying some either soft splints and the answer is yes and i have one here this is a real blue peter job because this is one we made earlier we make a lot of soft cast knees and elbow splints they are by far the most comfortable night splints for knees we make them in the department they take about 15 20 minutes they are very easy to put on extremely comfortable to wear and although they look quite flexible they don't actually bend up and down that easily. So they can be made a little bit more rigid than this one with some fiberglass here. This is semi-soft fiberglass, but we use a lot of softer splints only for knees and elbows, not for feet. So yes, you can have soft cast. If that doesn't help, soft cast splints, any physio can make them. So say it takes 20 minutes maximum in clinic. We send kids home with them. If that still doesn't help, then you need to splint during the day and use alternatives at night like sleep systems. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, you can have these for elbows too. <clears throat> right, another question. Uh, da, 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 da. I to jump off my table. Yeah, I'll just try it. We've got loads of questions coming in, right? Okay, um, no. We've got plenty of Oh, it's eight o'clock. Okay, we've got still a lot to do on ASOs and other splints, but let's take some questions for about five minutes and then we'll okay. do the splints and then we'll take the rest as questions. Okay, no worries. Um, Elsie seems to be really struggling uh, to sit comfortably out of her brace now, yet complains a lot at having to wear it, um, getting hot, uh, feeling restricted. Would you say that she should be wearing it for most of the waking day or does there need to be a balance with her having a flexible curve? 
Okay, there's several things that we need to think about when wearing jackets. A child who feels restricted, we've got to ask, what is the problem? Is the jacket restrictive or is the child just feeling weaker in the jacket? Now, that's a crazy idea, I know. But think about it. It's the same with spinal surgery. If you're hunched out of your jacket, it's very easy to get your hands to your mouth. It's very easy to move around. Put a jacket on, everything gets straighter, everything gets taller, your hands are further from your head, further from your mouth. Things get harder because there's further to reach for everything you want to do. So is that the restriction? Is it the fact that the child is straighter and therefore their hands are not as functional with the jacket on? Then maybe we need to be looking at work on the arms in the jacket. People forget this, that actually you really do need to work those arms, physios, parents, everybody need to work those arms in the jacket to bring the arms to that position where they can function better in the jacket. With the new treatments, get working those arms, because if we're not going to stand and walk, we need those arms working. So that's the first issue. Is it about the child being taller and more restricted because they're longer in the jacket? Is the jacket uncomfortable? Is it making red marks? Are those red marks disappearing within 20 minutes or not? Now, if a jacket doesn't make red marks, the possibility is it's not actually doing an awful lot. So some jackets will mark, but that's just from being held in the right place. Those marks should disappear. They should never break the skin. And they really shouldn't be that uncomfortable, just a feeling of pressure, not pain. So is the jacket painful or is it just restrictive? And then we need to look at a flexible curve fine. Do they need to wear it all day? We would say not, but it depends on age. It depends on what they're doing during the day and it depends on growth velocity. Now, all these concepts are a little bit mad, but very often it's the speed the child is growing that changes the curve. If your child is on a slow velocity, and that's between growth spurts, and we know that children have growth spurts around the age of four, around the age of seven, pre-puberty, all these growth spurts, then you are growing fast and you are changing fast. And at those points, we need the jacket on more. But if you are not going through a growth spurt, if your growth is reasonably static, then yes, you can consider having it off more on when you're sloppy, when you're tired, fatigued, car seat, buggy, wheelchair, whatever. So yes, there needs to be a balance. Orthotics should never be a battle. It should always be a worked out, well working compromise to get the best for everybody. Okay, uh, another question. Um, it's quite a long one, so bear with me. My type three five-year-old does lots of sport uh, apart from physical therapy. He goes to tennis once a week, swimming once a week, horse riding twice a week, uh, boxing one time. Also, he goes to school full time from 8.30 to uh, 4 p.m. and two times has the physical therapy lessons with his class uh, now he is able to do all these things the physiotherapy sessions are becoming more and more boring and instead of his physiotherapy sessions which he has twice a week uh, he would rather do more swimming or more tennis do you think that in this case the physiotherapy is still needed or can it be fully replaced with sports uh, physio's boring is a big problem. No physio should be boring. Not for a type three. It should be fun. It should be games. It should be activity. If the physio is boring, then yes, but do not stop. You have a five-year-old type three who is going to go through a growth spurt where things are going to change, where you're going to have the effects of nucinersen, where contractures may set in. We don't know for sure that they won't. They may not but they may. So what I will say is you firstly, if you've only got a physio and it's boring, do not stop completely. If you are seen by a neuromuscular service twice a year, 
it may well be that your physiotherapist only needs to review them once a month in between visits to the neuromuscular service. So you need a balance, but do not stop physio completely if you are not under a neuromuscular service, because that physio should be monitoring spine, contractures, neck position, overall mobility and overall symmetry. So if the physio is boring, it may be that you need to shoot your physio and find a new one, but don't stop completely because a good physio even if they're not doing anything, should be monitoring a growing child. Impressive repertoire of activity. Though. I'm exhausted just reading the question. I know. I don't know how they put them in. I, I could only assume there's no brothers or sisters because I don't know how that... I used to do 40 miles one evening, getting my son from Tai Jitsu to football and my daughter in between to and from her tap lessons. And I used to do a 40-mile round trip one night a week so i can understand that that is absolutely crazy but well done you if that's what you can do go for it but don't don't beware of fatigue please and beware of mental fatigue as well that this will get harder and harder there are only five that's fine but when school becomes more um demanding you may need to drop some sport Right. OK, um, I've got another question. Um, can Marianne help with information on adult knee problems? I have a very hyperextended right knee joint. The normal type knee braces are so hard. I find it more difficult when I transfer. I do not walk, but I still transfer by standing. Would a softer brace help? And could you recommend anything? There's two types of bracing for hyperextending knees. Now, there is a brace. Um, I haven't used it for a long time, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to Google this and see if it still exists. So bear with me for a second. It's called a Swedish knee cage. Um, we used to use it a lot in children with cerebral palsy who hyperextended. I'm not sure if they're, st well, it looks as though they're still available. Um, yes, a Swedish knee cage. Let me see if I can get a picture up for you on my phone. I'm sure it won't transfer very well. Um, but that's what it looks like. I don't know, you can't see it on here. Look up a Swedish knee cage and they can stop the hyperextension. They're, they're a bit strange and they don't work on people who've got chunky thighs and skinny calves because they tend to slide down, but they can stop hyperextension. The other thing that you can do to stop hyperextension is you can use a brace similar to this, but not a great high thigh corset. What you do is you have a fairly low thigh corset. It's almost just a strap here and a fixed knee. So what happens is the knee bends when you want it to bend, but then stops when the knee is straight to stop it hyperextending. Now, if you have something like this, it does need to go all the way down into your shoe. But you can get what we call free knee cathos. As I say, they don't have to come all the way up to your bum. Free knee cathos stop hyperextension. And we do put some of the type threes with great hyperextension into that it doesn't lock it's free but it will only extend so far and stop the hyperextension and that's a fairly bog standard idea of free knee cafo or leg orthosis that will stop hyperextension that is obviously chunkier it needs to be put on but because it does open at least you can sit in them and then it can stop that hyperextension when you stand to transfer so that is not impossible. Or as I say, the Swedish knee cage, it may be if you've got a good orthotist, they can make you a free knee cafe, or it might have to, somebody may have to get you a Swedish knee cage to try. Those are the only ones I'm aware of. I'm sure there are probably other hyperextension braces, but not that I have used just for hyperextension. Okay, so another question about... Um knees a couple of them actually um my son has a brace with a hole cut out uh oh, this is uh sorry spinal jackets my son has a brace with a hole cut out 
off the belly area. Straps are at the back. I'm not sure he looks comfortable. Uh, uh, he, does, he, he, doesn't like, he doesn't like to wear it for too long, as he says it's not comfortable. Um, where it's not comfortable. I mean, we have to ask these children where it's not comfortable and why. We need to look for red marks. We need to make sure it's doing the job it's doing. A, a brace that fastens at the back is not impossible. Um, there are some braces that fasten at the back, but it's much harder to get the tummy right with a brace that fastens at the back because you can't control what the tummy and the waist is doing with something that fastens at the back. Once the front is fixed, it's fixed. There's no jiggling. There's no room for the ribs to move. There's no room for the tummy to move. So back fastening don't seem to be as comfortable as front fastening when the children want a little bit of wiggle room for their ribs and their belly. Okay, excellent. Uh... How do you do an x-ray with a child who can't, um, I assume, sit without support? Does sitting with support make sense um, or lying down? Well, that depends what you're looking for on the x-ray. Um, if a child cannot sit without a brace, what are we looking for in a sitting x-ray? Um, if you want to know what the brace is doing, then yes, of course, you have to x-ray inside the brace. But a child who can't sit should not be sit, sat to x-ray if you're looking for scoliosis. If the scoliosis is there when lying down, then the child needs to be lying down for the x-ray. So I'm not sure why you would have an x-ray of a spine in sitting for a child who can't sit. Okay. Um, what are the benefits of standing outside of a standing frame? that's a whole nother section and we've discussed it before in exercise we've discussed it in other areas standing in a standing frame is completely passive you can be doing absolutely nothing you're not working your trunk you're not working your hips you're not working your legs it is passive and on that basis you are doing nothing it is doing all the work we don't like that we like the children in cafes because they're working. They're working their hips, they're working their trunk, they're working their arms, they're working their legs, they're doing balance, they're doing core. Everything is working when they're standing in cafes. And that is standing. Standing in a standing frame is being in a position that is upright. Okay. Uh, what's the next question we have here? Um, I think uh, I'll... Can we go on to feet? Yeah, go for it. We are Hi, Mandy. Yeah. Let's go on to feet um, and then we'll come back to questions. I think there's going to be 100 million questions. <laughs> I think that maybe next time we need to do a recap of these four that we've already done and go back through questions because there are a lot of questions around maybe recap the four that we've done before we go on to new topics okay. um, and I, I did say I wanted to talk about tape and it may be that we have to leave that to next time now foot orthotics okay this is an ankle foot orthosis it is set at 90 degrees it is made of plastic we like custom made we do not like off the shelf this is a night resting splint or a day resting splint or a standing splint or whatever splint. We do not use anything that looks like this. They are stretching splints. They're certainly not for at night in bed. That is not a night splint. If you are being given a stretching splint with these straps for at night in bed, forget it. Either undo the straps or cut the straps. There is no point in trying to stretch the ankle in bed at night, it is not a comfortable way to sleep and it's not effective as soon as you bend your knee. So these are not night splints. So the most common splint that we have for feet from the type ones up to some of the type threes are these little foot splints, AFOs. John Florida had this little hole at the bottom, if you can see it. I can shine the light through it. That is not for the sweat to drip out, although sometimes it does seem like that. 
it is to check that the heel is right down. Now you will notice that our splints are not lined apart from over any bony bits around the ankles. We do not line our splints. Generally, SMA kids are fairly hot and sweaty. One child gave us this. She'd been given this lovely fluffy boot, which actually was half of a Ponsetti boots and bars by the looks of things, because it has this little screw at the bottom. She couldn't get on with this at all. It, was, it looks like something out of Star Wars, uh, very fluffy and sweaty. Generally, what we say is wear a sock, wear stockinette. Some of the kids wear nothing. Usually they wear a cotton sock or chop the toes out of a cotton sock and wear them because a line splint can get sweaty and smelly and fungally and disgusting. And it also rubs much more strangely enough than an unlined split. We have air holes at the back, doesn't make an awful lot of difference, but a lot of the kids like them. So they can be worn during the day, they can be worn at night. A lot of our type ones are wearing these, but they add a lot of weight to a type one. So beware that a foot splint on a type one should normally be used when they're inactive because it will restrict their movement. Okay, let's move down to something called a smaffo or a daffo. Now, what is the difference between a smaffo, a supramalli, malleola, ankle orthosis, your malleoli are the big bones that stick out at the sides of your ankle. So a supramalleola orthosis is a splint mostly, almost exclusively for type three. A lot of the type threes have wibbly wobbly ankles that roll over when you're walking. Now, the bigger type threes need a fairly rigid plastic. Interestingly, it has this big dip at the back that allows the foot to go up and down, but stops it rolling in and out. That's a smaffo, a supramalleolar ankle foot orthosis, flat foot lots of straps comes quite close around the top of the foot some afos are like this some companies make their afos quite closed like these foot splints ours are quite open but some companies have them quite closed that's absolutely fine to control the foot this is a smaffo as i say very much for the type threes allows up and down but no rolling this is a cerebral palsy splint. This is a DAFO. This is a dynamic ankle foot orthosis. It's almost identical, but it has lumps and bumps on the bottom. And if you feel inside here, there's a lump here, there's a lump here. That is supposed to reduce tone in cerebral palsy. Our children do not have tone. If you get one of these things with a lump there and lumps here, it is wrong. Now, I will be very honest and say we're hardly using these at all because we found something much, much nicer. And a lot of our kids are using these. A lot of our kids who have wibbly wobbly ankles, whether they've got SMA or something else, and this is, this is the one we use most, but there's many types. It's called a push acqui, P-U-S-H, push brace, A-E-Q-U-I, push acqui ankle brace. It's a tri-lock brace, and it's a tri-lock because it has three straps. We like them, the kids like them, the parents like them, they're easy. We actually keep a stock of them at the hospital. Very, very easy. There's a semi-rigid medial section, so that goes on. This is a left foot. The foot goes in here, one strap, and it's easy to know where the straps are because strap one has one dot, strap two has two dots. And strap three has three dots and where they fasten is all marked as well. It's very easy. It's very comfortable. It goes inside the shoe. It holds the foot. Try locks. Very comfortable. Stop that roll. Very, very popular. Can be bought on the internet. You need to 
check the sizes. That's a size one, which will fit eight, nine year old upwards, but they do do smaller ones. So trilock splints, several different types. We just happen to like the push aqui insoles, flat feet, total waste of time, gel insoles, just a total and utter waste of time apart from painful feet. This lump is not where it should be. If you're going to support the arch, it should be under the arch. That's not under the arch. That's merely in the midfoot. And you're just going to roll over something soft and squishy like that. But if you've got painful feet, a gel insole. Now, this is an attempt at a heel cup. It's rigid. It's horrible. It's quite hard. Hope you can hear that. You probably can. That's rigid and it's horrible and the kids don't like them. And it's got no posting. So ultimately, if your heel is rolling in, you don't want an insole. You need something around the heel to push it back, which is fine. But it also has to be tipped a little bit, which this one isn't. And it shouldn't be this horrible rigid material. It should be a semi-rigid splint inside your shoes. We use quite a lot of heel cups or extended heel cups but not in this nasty rigid material. I think that just about covers feet. We don't use insoles. Flat feet do not need treating unless the heel is rolling in. That's pronated feet. Flat feet are flat feet, don't need treatment unless they're painful. Very rare to get painful flat feet in children, but rolled in feet can be painful. Smathos, trilocks, extended heel cups. But insoles are a waste of time. That's done feet. We have about 10 minutes left for questions. Okay, right. Let's crack through as many as we can. Um, are the gaiters mandatory for standing on standing frame or with AFO? No, you don't need gaiters. A good standing frame shouldn't need any orthoses except an AFO. And then you only need an AFO if... Um, you've got wibbly wobbly ankles. Some of the children wear boots. Now, Piedro boots, heavy, inflexible, clunky boots. We don't like boots. We don't like boots at all. We like trainers. We prefer a good orthosis inside a trainer to a heavy, clunky, inflexible boot. But they can be used in standing frames, but you don't a good standing frame in a good position should not need gaiters. We have several children using cafos and gaiters inside standing frames, but a well set up standing frame shouldn't need them, even with knee flexion contractors. Okay. Um, this is a question we get quite a lot actually about various topics. Um, how do we find a center who has knowledge of SMA so that we could get whatever is recommended in this webinar? Is it a standardized protocol which orthotists should follow? for SMA and we've kind of talked about this. Unfortunately, there is no standardized protocol and no standardized orthotic company. We have two types of orthotists. Well, we have several. We have the inexperienced orthotist who is prepared to learn, the inexperienced orthotist who is not prepared to learn because they know everything. We have the experienced orthotist who will ring John Florence at every turn and the experienced orthotist who thinks he knows it all. So we have the problem of many orthotic companies think that they can do it just as well as every other orthotic company. What we need to do is try and spread the knowledge. We, I was at an orthotic workshop last Saturday with orthotists. Um, it's very hard to learn sitting in a lecture in a morning how to make an orthosis. Ultimately, if you are under a center and you, every child in the UK, and that's only in the UK that I'm talking about here, every child in the UK should be seen by a neuromuscular service. Every neuromuscular service should have a decent orthotic company. Many of them don't. Many of them don't agree with what we say. I know there are at least three centers, big centers in the UK who do not agree with CAFOs in SMA. We have fought with them, we have discussed with them, we have talked to them. They won't change their minds. They think they're a waste of time, and that's the physios as well as the consultants. I cannot make them change their minds. I cannot see every child with SMA. Newcastle can't, Evelina can't. 
we can't send everybody privately. What we have to do is educate and say, this is what we need. But ideally, authorists will contact Peacocks, John Florence, or another good authority company and ask them for help. We can't but try and increase the knowledge of autists. Okay, thank you. Um, another question. My son's feet are a little bit twisted. They look a bit twisted in the splints too. Are there adjustments we should be doing to the foot splints? It's very... <laughs> It's, feet are a really difficult thing because one of the problems is everybody thinks feet are easy to splint and, and people love splinting feet. They hate splinting hips, they love splinting feet, but they don't always do it well. And sometimes if there is tightness in the back of the ankle, a tendo Achilles, then you will not get a good position. You have two problems. The feet will roll in in SMA. That is quite normal. For some reason, SMA feet roll in. Most children roll out, SMA feet roll in. If that is still happening in the splint, you can try a Y strap and different strapping. If the foot is very fixed, then that's not going to work. And what we would do with a fixed foot is serial casting with taping. Now, I did say I was going to talk about taping. We like taping. It's not a cure. We use a lot of tape when we're serial casting. Um, if you hear me ever talking about tape that I've seen, you'd think I'll hate tape. I am wearing tape. I even taped my own back. I'm not sure what this tape is. It doesn't look. My preferred tape, if we're looking at tape, and it went flying somewhere, if parents are going to go out and buy tape, this is one of my favorite tapes. I don't have shares in them. They're not, we're not related. Um, I like rock tape. You can get it at Superdrug. A good tape should always have markings on the back so that you know how much you're actually using. So we talk about a section, which is usually from one word rock tape to the next, or there are all the other tapes uh, the Kinesio tape is marked in sections. If you buy it from Tiger, you won't find any markings. That's a rock tape. But we use tapes to hold the foot. Now, it's not a cure. And a foot that rolls in very often rolls in more when you're standing on it. One of the worst problems is weight bearing twists the foot more so that you either need to try and control it in the splint or you need to think is this foot tight do i need to try and cast it into a better position okay um i think i've captured uh everybody's uh oh no there's just one more coming we squeeze it in um can most orthotic teams make the brace uh, where it fastens at the front rather than the back. Um, I think my no. child needs to be d uh, redone so that it fastens at the front. I think in theory every orthotist should have been trained in how to do it. They obviously have a preference for doing it at the back. They obviously believe for whatever reason that doing it at the back gets them a better fit or is an easier way to cast. If you truly feel they'd be better with a front opening, ask for a front opening. Ask them why they won't do a front opening. And if you want to try one, can you ask them, please, would they try a front opening one? And if they're not happy, could they consult an orthotic company who do use front opening braces? As I say, John Florence are not the only ones who use front opening. Peacocks use front opening as well. John Florence are perfectly capable of making back opening ones. Once you've taken the cast, you can mark it where you want to open it. So in theory, if they're casting the child for the jacket, all they have to do is do the markings for the straps at the front and the openings at the front, not the back. But you will have to ask them and try and justify and ask them to do it. Now, the other problem that we have with asking orthotic companies to do anything is getting the uh, budget holder to agree to more than one. So that what we often find is that uh, we ask for a brace, the child doesn't want to wear it locally, and they'll abandon it because the attitude is, well, you've had one, you're not getting another one. 
So there are budgets we need to consider when asking for more than one if we're not happy with the one we've got. So you may find that the answer is no. Okay, awesome. Um, I think that's all the questions. Uh, if I've missed any questions, then people please do email um, either myself, andy.thornton at treesma.uk or lucy.frost at the next, treesma.uk. The next, the next subject was meant to be about equipment. Um, we can look at equipment, but we can also look at doing recaps of the last four, I think might be useful for people who haven't caught every webinar or people who want to recap on the sort of things we've already talked about. Okay, well, let's go for that. So we will do probably about half on equipment, including sleep systems. Uh, we're going to do one on pain. So if people want to talk, you know, people have got to let us know what they want, but the three that we're planning are pain, equipment and walking losing walking gaining walking now obviously that's a more limited audience but we can talk about walking in cafes as well that's talking about gaining or trying walking in adults in walking slings so those are the three topics we've still got to cover but if people have got other ideas if people want more let us know awesome so there are as usual there's more questions coming in so what we'll do Marianne is I will email them to you and no and if you don't mind providing an answer we can pass them on absolutely fine brilliant well thank you as ever Marianne it's been a, a very informative session loads of questions um, so thank you very much and we will talk to you again next time. people people can still ask questions in between the sessions you don't have to wait for the sessions if you have one to question if you want some information if you want some ideas or some pointers, just email Andy and he will pass them on. It doesn't have to be around the time of these sessions. Brilliant. All right. Thanks a lot, Marianne. Speak to you next month. No problem. Thanks a lot. Bye.